This is the Monday, April 24th, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis. And this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine sets the dial for a little novelization of history. Our guide on this journey is Barbara Stark Neiman, author of Even in Darkness. Spanning a century and three continents, Even in Darkness tells the story of Clara Kohler. From her early years in a prosperous German-Jewish family, through an adulthood of love, two world wars, a concentration camp, and an unconventional life in post-war Germany. You can find our guest at barbarastarkneiman.com, bstarkneiman on Twitter, or at facebook.com slash starkneiman. That last name is spelled N-E-M-O-N. Barbara earned an undergraduate degree in English literature and art history, and a master's in speech-language pathology from the University of Michigan, which led to a teaching and clinical career. But all along, she wanted to tell a story. And readers are fortunate that she did that in this, her very first book. A first book that reads like it's her 10th or 12th bestseller. Okay, now that we've fueled up the old flux capacitor, let's join up with Barbara Stark Neiman and crack open even in darkness. I'm joined via Skype by novelist Barbara Stark Neiman, author of Even in Darkness, finalist for the 2016 International Book Awards for Historical Fiction, and a book I really enjoyed. I love to get a novel in for everybody every now and then. Thank you so much, Barbara, for making the time to talk with the History Author Show. Thank you, Dean. It's my absolute pleasure. This book came at me in so many ways. Lots of people think their family's ups and downs, for instance, would make a great story, but almost none of us ever take that first step to compiling that story, especially somebody who's never written a book before. So when I see your icon there on Twitter, it's really meeting a new friend on there when you meet somebody and you say, well, is this this lady's sixth book? Is it her first? Is she a writer by trade? Is this something that's fiction? And you start to dig into it. And I had many wow moments. And I think that that one about you being a first time author, that was really the biggest wow of all. And I wanted to ask you with an eye towards inspiring people to pick up that pen. I guess today people pick up the laptop or the iPad. How did you manage to get even in darkness over all of those humps and all of the self doubt and all of the challenges that ended up in final publication and on a shelf? That's an amazing achievement. Well, thank you. First of all, I had heard all of these stories of my family's lives in the 20th century in Germany all my life long. In contrast to a lot of victims and survivors of the Holocaust and other genocides, my family constantly talked about their former lives. And then there's the fact that the people who underlie the characters in Even in Darkness Many of them were real people, and they truly inspired me. I knew their stories. I was captivated by them, and those stories just wouldn't let me go. So I just had to write them. (laughs) Those inside you, literally, when you have that moment, I think it's a New Yorker cartoon or maybe a far side, and it's a doctor, and he has the writer up against the x-ray machine, and he says, well, what do you know? You really do have a novel in you. <laughs> and that's your kind of thing here. It just has to come out. It bubbles up inside of you and you do get it published. And it's not as if it sits on the shelf. I mentioned to you also via Twitter that there are 
all of these stickers on your book. There's three stickers on the front of my copy of your book, each one for a different honor. That was a very unique thing. When I picked it up, I said, wow. And I looked into these. These are real honors. These are really impressive things for any author, but especially a first time author. However, I wanted to talk a little bit about the pitfalls instead of just the praising of you overcoming the usual challenges. You had yet another one. You're writing about family lore, and sometimes that can be a little bit risky to tell the family stories. And I wonder if you had any of your relations that said maybe they didn't want you to tell Clara's story. What was their reaction when they saw it in print? So that's a great question, and admittedly one that I did not understand the implications of well before I wrote the book. Even before I started writing even in darkness, I had a pretty traumatic experience with a cousin of mine about writing another family story. And I learned a lot from that incident. In fact, I now give workshops and talks and write articles to would-be memoirists and novelists about what you have to be careful of when you write about a real family. So to answer your question directly, I gave manuscripts of Even in Darkness to my mom and to all my siblings before I submitted it for publication, and they all loved it. And since they hadn't done as much of the research, they hadn't done any research, but they knew the stories as I did, but they had a lot of questions about what really happened and what I made up, which made me feel great because they knew these people and they knew the story. So if they couldn't tell the difference, it was good. I did have one person that underlies one of the characters write me a very desperate email that an author never wants to hear, that I'd done a beautiful job of telling the story, but that this person feared being recognized and was worried about being recognized. I'm just not permitting the book to be distributed in that country. So that was my response, but it was a real cautionary tale. So that's a great question. It has to be a challenge when you're trying to write it real and stick true to the real people that are in your book. But the living always say, well, maybe I don't want to. There's always one person in there who's going to say, get me out of there completely or be nervous. And with good reason, especially today with the internet, people can find you easily. You don't necessarily want that brought about. This is a long life. Every life is going to have some trouble in it. But these lives that we're talking about here in Even in Darkness, those are real problems and real challenges. Of course, you're talking about the Depression. You're talking about World War II and the Holocaust. As you bring us through all of those years to cover them, you start each chapter at a different date in time, which allows you to cover this century, really, beginning in 1913, cover this huge expanse of time. So start us off at the beginning and tell us who are these people, these relatives of yours that inspire even in darkness, and why should readers follow them on this journey, and why are so many already choosing to follow them on this journey? The character Clara Kohler, who's the main character in the book, is based on my great aunt. And the priest that she cared for is the other main character in the book. They lived through all of both world wars and the Holocaust and ended up together in Germany after World War II. I came to know and love them both across two generations, across an ocean and a language, and their story of love and devotion conquering the loss and the suffering that they both experienced is a timeless story. But really, until I wrote this book and readers started feeding back to me, I didn't understand that Clara's unerring capacity to reinvent her life in a way that honored her past, forgot nothing, but forgave a great deal for the sake of creating meaning out of the horror that she experienced. That's a life lesson that inspires many other people, as it did me. It's hard to let even small things go. We all struggle with that to some degree. And the fact that Clara doesn't let this cripple her, the fact that she's able to go forward and live a life, the life that's denied here to millions and millions of people that are family, friends, neighbors of hers, is an incredible story. I can see why this would have stuck with you and how fortunate that you were able to hear those stories. 
everybody talked about it, but you finally decided to pick up that pen and you had it inside of you for so many years. You also choose a quotation at the top of every chapter. And I always like to ask authors about that because when I look at that, I say, oh, this poor author has an eye for quotations, which is what I have myself. And I like to ask where you got them. But then the hard part there, how did you make each one earn its spot in the book? Well, thank you again, because those quotations are all important to me. My university degrees are in English literature, journalism, art history, and speech and language pathology. So it's kind of wide. And these quotations came from artists, from musicians, from authors, from theologians, and they really are meant to set the stage for the chapters that they introduce. How did you choose? You must have had hundreds of them, I would assume, if not more. Pretty much. As I was writing the book, and even more as I was researching the book, I would come across in my research or in ancillary reading, I would come across quotations or parts of letters, and those quotes would just speak to me. And then I did have quite an extensive list. And then when I was actually writing the book, I would look at that list and I would say, okay, this belongs here. So it was kind of a combination of an inspirational part and then a matching part. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of things came together here for you when you were writing this book. I, I bet a lot of people are jealous of that. It all came together because you had this vision, I guess, that just took place over many, many years in your life. So you were able to put it together and put it on paper. One of the challenges for me as far as making a show like this flow when it's with a novelist, especially if it's a mystery or a life story, is I don't want to give too much away. And I mentioned to you that often when I do a novel and I interview the author, I'll wait until after the interview to read, say, the last third of the novel. So I don't risk giving too much of the end away. But for even in darkness, I just said, well, I'm just going to have to not give away all the everything that happens because I really wanted to finish it. One way to bring a novel to life a little bit is I like to ask the author to read something. And you and I both had a bunch of things from the book, sort of like these quotations that we picked out, which tells people something about the strength of your writing. So we did narrow it down to just one brief outtake, and I was wondering if you'd read that for us now so people can get a flavor for the book, for Clara, and for your writing. I would love to. So this is actually right from the very beginning of the book, and Clara is riding a bicycle, thinking about the marriage proposal that she's just received, and she's on holiday with her family, but she's riding by herself. A sweet scent of clover and raspberries floated on the breeze as Clara cycled down to the North Sea village. A woman from the village approached on a bicycle and Clara automatically moved to the right of the path, still lost in thought. A moment later, however, she stopped, intent on the approaching figure. Only yesterday, near this very spot, two boys hardly out of knee pants had ridden toward her. One of them had suddenly veered into her path, and reflexively, Clara had steered away into the brambles of the hedgerow. She'd not fallen, but her leg had become entangled in her skirts, and the heavy steel of the bicycle had banged painfully against her thigh. The boys laughed as they raced on, and unmistakably she had heard, Jew, as their bicycles receded behind her. When had the florid Christian neighbors peddling their way to and from the shops lost their stolid place in the scenery and begun to etch menace into the landscape instead? Where did you get that? Where was the inspiration for that? Is that something you had or is that moment there something you come up with? I'm fascinated by this idea of you combining the real stories with the things that you make up to sew everything together. This sense of when did my relatives know? When did their sense that politics in their country and life as they knew it would just have to put up with this change that had come over in 1933 when Hitler came to power? When is it that suddenly they realized, wait a second, this isn't going to be normal. This isn't going to work out 
something's really wrong here because it was a very gradual process. So I wanted that sort of mundane, man, I've just been asked, I don't know if I want to marry this guy or not. I'm going for a bike ride to kind of think about it. And then this intrusion of this other thing to worry about. That's how I came up with that scene is I wanted her to be doing what every other 19 year old girl would do when she had been asked to get married by someone that she wasn't sure about. She'd go and think about it. She'd have some romantic thoughts. She'd have some concerns. But then this other menacing aspect of life around her intrudes. How did that feel? What was that like? So that's where I came up with this scene. It's sort of a stick in the spokes right there emotionally. And it's key here, especially for Jewish readers. I know that's what has really attracted your book and won many of these accolades is there's this sense, obviously, among the Jewish people that, well, we're always being persecuted. And so it's this is going to be just another dark time. And yet life has to go on. We have to keep having weddings. We have to keep making young Jewish people, so to speak. I mean, frankly, that's the thinking. We're going to still have Passover. We're going to remember that there have been hard times before, and we will get through this hard time. Nobody can know what is going to happen, that this is going to be a trial on the scale that nobody in the world has ever seen before, no people in the world before. And when you read it with our benefit of hindsight from the 20th century, you want to say, keep riding that bicycle to France and then beyond France to somewhere where it's safe, right? <laughs> and for an author, that's a challenge because you can't write that. You you know what's coming. You have to hold that inside. For a first-time author, so impressive to read and see the strings of that restraint that you have in the book. You chose a quote for chapter 21, for instance, which is 1943. That's the height of the Second World War and the Holocaust. It's, quote, True history is the history of the spirit, the human spirit, which may at times seem powerless, but ultimately is yet superior and survives, because even if it has not yet the might, it still possesses the power, the power that can never cease, unquote. Who said that? And did that flow for you when you're thinking about things like that? Is that one of those quotes that just jumped out of you and said, okay, put me in your book. Here you go. Well, this is an actual quote from Dr. Leo Beck, who was the chief rabbi in Germany before World War II. He was interned in the concentration camp Theresienstadt and provided spiritual support and the very urgent message of the need to survive to the other Jews that were in that camp, including my great aunt. He and Clara had a very deep and abiding friendship that lasted for the rest of both of their lives. And he was a prolific essayist and writer. He wrote many, many sermons. And there's a whole institute in New York and in London that bears his name. And this came from one of his inspirational talks that he gave in Theresienstadt. So clearly that's why I used it in that chapter. <laughs> Again, it just screamed out at you and said, okay, put me in there. That's a great thing to find as an author. Yep. I mentioned that you use those dates at the front of a chapter. And frankly, for me, sometimes that'll strike me when I read a book and I'll say, okay, antenna's up, I guess. And is the author leaning on those date stamps so that they don't have to actually set the scene? So when I find things in Even in Darkness, like you have your characters remarking on the advent of private air travel, I appreciate that so much more. Details like that tell us what the date is. They tell us the time. They tell us what's going on in the world. Again, first-time author, all of this is, is incredible to me. I wondered if those kinds of details were from family stories or if that was something where you kind of had to dig around and say, all right, I don't want to just put a stamp on there and say 1943 and count on the reader know what's happening that year. Was that separate research or was it something you just knew Jacob would be impressed with in a given year? Well, no, this is definitely research. I did a ton of research online in books in archives, and most importantly, on site and in museums in Germany, in the Czech Republic, and in Israel. And I also did extensive interviews of 
both my grandparents when they were alive and my parents of the main characters, Clara and the priest, I translated over a hundred letters and I really tried to make sure that if I said in 1923 that there were gas lamps on the streets of Dortmund, there better have been gas lamps and not electric lights or whatever. So I really attended to that in order to make the story as authentic and to deepen the experience for the reader of actually being there. That was very definitely one of my goals in writing this fiction was to really make sure I also had a great copy editor. (laughs) So if I made a mistake, she found it and helped out. But I got to say, I did pretty well on my own. And was this something that you wrote many years? Can you even pinpoint the moment that you started? Or was there that moment you said, well, I'm really going to sit down and it's going to be a novel now? Oh, I definitely, it took me 15 years to research and write this book because I was a speech and language pathologist working with deaf kids and I raised my own three kids. There was a day when I was standing in Clara's dining room and looking at a painting on her wall that was not like all of the other calm, antique, sort of deep, rich, delicious decorating that her home had. It was kind of more German expressionist painting and I asked her about it. She said, oh, that's the first painting that I bought after the war and there was this character in the bottom that was kind of a black miasma of a character she said that reminded me of how it felt then and I just looked at her and said how did you do this how did you always get the glass half full feeling in your life and how did you forget all that pain and she just looked at me she said I never forget the pain and in that moment I knew that she simply chose life and positive way to look at the world. And at that moment, I knew, man, I've got a book to write. Then it took me 15 years to do all the interviews, go to all the places, get all the stories, and then actually sit down and write it. (laughs) (laughs) Did you tell her then that you wanted to write a book about her life? Or is that not... did. She lived to be a hundred years old and she knew that I was writing that story. And she gave me the most wonderful interviews as the priest did. So it was such a, it was an honor to be able to interview them. And it really is for me, a legacy story to be able to bring her story to the world. Well, Barbara, I have to confess to you, you spent 15 years writing it. I am sitting here feeling so guilty that I read it in maybe three days. <laughs> and I was going to say two days, which is the truth, but that sounded even too short. But I just <laughs> spent a weekend sort of with my nose buried in even in darkness because it was really riveting. I love books that just let you know the people and see their lives. I love TV shows like that, too. I mean, I could watch the characters from The Sopranos just sit and eat their lunch, you know, at Satriali's and talk. And I like that kind of book because, of course, that's not really what's happening. There is action happening. And even in darkness, there's a life being lived and important things. But it's very character driven. You really are rooting for these people that are in the book. So uh, do you forgive me for reading it so quickly? Are you kidding? (laughs) When a reader says to me, I couldn't put your book down And I read it in two days. That is music to my ears. There's nothing to be forgiven. (laughs) My guest is Barbara Stark Neiman, author of the novel, Even in Darkness. You can find her online at barbarastarkneiman.com and at bstarkneiman on Twitter, which is where I found her. You can find her, too. You can also go to facebook.com slash starkneiman. That last name for all of those is N-E-M-O-N. Book Riot listed Even in Darkness on its list of 100 must-read works of Jewish fiction, two ahead of Sophie's Choice. Miriam Bradman Abrams of the Jewish Book Council said of Even in Darkness, quote, This beautifully written story gives the reader insight into a woman who followed an unusual path and a different angle on post-World War II life, unquote. 
And as I said, Barbara, it's racked up a bunch of awards, all those stickers on the front of the book, especially impressive for a first time author. I really want to give you a lot of praise to let people know. Sometimes I say first time author, they may be a little bit put off, but this is a real book published by a real publishing house. It's not just something you rushed out there. It's really amazing. I, I really compliment your editor too, because you can see that hand in here, really tight writing. I enjoyed it. I hope other people will too. I want to focus there, back up a minute, to that 100 must-read works of Jewish fiction. Even in Darkness showcased your uncanny memory for those family stories. I mentioned earlier about how the Jewish people always have had this persecution, have always wandered, looking for a home, a place to rest, sort of maybe, unfortunately, used to things like that, being cursed on the street there, just trying to ride your bike. And I found myself thinking that, Oral histories were not only the first histories, but since the Jewish people for so long were unable to find a permanent home, were nomadic, they traveled light, no time for the bread to rise, for instance, for, and so we have matzah on Passover. So you're traveling without books. You talk there about being with Clara and talking, which is something that we've really lost, I think, today in this generation, when I look at younger people, just talk with your with your older relatives, because they aren't going to be there forever. Get their stories, even if you never are going to sit down and write a great best-selling book, like even in darkness, out of it. I wonder if you think that need to tell stories, to tell this story, seeped into you with more gravity because of that background and because so many people, frankly, didn't live to tell their stories because they died in the Holocaust. Absolutely, Dean. My grandfather was an attorney in Germany, and he was a master storyteller. When he came to this country, as I said, he told the stories of his life, and he cultivated in his grandchildren skills at telling him great stories. We got extra desserts if he really liked <laughs> a story that we told him. And I grew up really always enjoying narrating what I saw around me. And that's what a writer does. I also chose a profession that was all about helping people communicate. So yes, it's in my DNA and it is in my chosen life experiences. And I do feel that this capacity to keep the elders' stories for the next generation is important for all of us, regardless of your cultural or religious background. When did Clara pass away? 1995. Okay. So you really kept this going, kept all those notes. That must have been very nice to have all those, as painful as it was to lose her. You knew that you were keeping that part of her alive, and she knew that too. What a comfort. Yes. And when she died, three months after she died, I got three huge boxes full of all her personal papers, including letters between her and her sons and all of the paperwork when she was in the concentration camp. So yes, it was really quite, quite an experience and quite a project. <laughs> You mentioned before the raspberry there. That's a smell, it's a sight, it's a taste. All good writing should have all five senses, so you cover those there. You also display this talent for describing scenes, making places and objects almost characters to advance the plot of Even in Darkness. One thing I noticed you doing a few times was using gardens and their flowers. Those were sprinkled throughout, growing throughout, if you will, sprouting throughout, even in darkness. So since I have you here, and this is one of my favorite parts of the job, is I get to ask authors things that I find in the books that I read, whereas before I started doing this show, I would just have to, well, back then we wrote letters, right? And you hoped somebody would answer it, maybe, and answer a question that you have. So I wanted to know, did you inherit a green thumb along with all of these stories, or was this something that you decided to use as a literary device? I definitely inherited. I'm a master gardener, Aha. so that is definitely something that is a treasure for me. My mom is a gardener, and Clara was a gardener. My favorite photo of her home is these mullioned glass windows, leaded glass windows, with a row of beautiful begonias growing 
on the windowsill. She loved to garden and she always had flowers around. So yes, <laughs> is the answer to your question. <laughs> and that was intentional, something you decided to use to sort of illustrate, because what a great descriptive talent you have for those things. Thank you. Well, it's a another spot where it, it arises out of love and a joint passion that she and I both had. And I want listeners to know that while your writing style includes these vivid descriptions that I just mentioned, it never gets bogged down. I always picture sort of if people have seen the movie Big Trouble in Little China for some reason, that's it. And when Lopan, the main evil character there, is doing his magic and he has the lights come out of his eyes or when you're able to go into a character when you're playing a video game, maybe it's something that you don't want to stand around in one character too long and be looking. You don't get bogged down in that regard in Even in Darkness. To me, though, it invoked the classic novels of a bygone age, ones you'd read maybe in high school, rather than the ones you pick up at an airport, gift shop, let's say, get on your flight, and you forget it shortly after you pick up your baggage when you land. These are titles like you can almost hear the editor rushing the author to cut, cut, cut sometimes when you read a modern book, say, get rid of this, get rid of this. You clearly keep in these great parts, and it works very well. And it's not just me speaking here. This is all the stickers, again, in the front of the books. Look at the accolades if you're thinking about picking up a copy of Even in Darkness. So how did you hone your eye? How did you hone that editorial skill and know when you lingered long enough on one of those flowers and when you just set the scene exactly right, and did anyone in the publication process balk at you, including that kind of richness? Was there anyone yelling at you, cut, cut, cut? No, there wasn't. Certainly not in the publication. By the time I got to the publication process, and I want to thank you for that appreciation because scene is very important to me as a writer, and especially in this book. I wrote Even in Darkness as fiction rather than memoir or biography because I wanted my readers to feel the immediacy of what happened. And I wanted them to be pulled into that vivid reality. I had a great copy editor and I had a wonderful, wonderful writers group. And so I kind of went through the refiner's fire of my own pretty good editorial skills, but then my writing group and a great copy editor to help really tighten, but keep expressive those scenes. So I did not get any pushback on the density of the prose. It seems to fit the story and it seems to fit the themes in the book. And I mentioned a few times here now these stickers on the cover of the book. So I wanted to make sure I ask you, what are some of the accolades you've won so people get an idea here of what those stickers are? And were you surprised when those started pouring in? What was the feeling? And is there one that means a lot to you on a personal level above the others, not to ask you to pick a favorite? When the book came out in 2015, the next year, which was this past year, I did win a number of literary awards. The first one was the Story Circle Network's Sartan Women's Literary Award for historical fiction. I won two Indie Fab awards from Forward Reviews, the review journal, a gold medal for literary fiction, and also one for historical fiction. And then the independent publishers gave me a gold medal for European fiction. And as you said earlier, the International Book Awards, I, even in darkness, was a finalist for. This did mean a great, great deal to me because if you look on Amazon, I've gotten some great reader reviews. The people that I know that have read the book have said wonderful things. But this is kind of an independent view of the book for people who don't know me, don't know anything about me. They don't know anything about my family story. They just simply have read the book and compared it to many, many, many other books. So yes, it meant a great deal to me. And I, I was absolutely thrilled to get that kind of recognition. I just looked you up on Amazon and yes, you have almost a perfect five-star review. So that gives people an idea that it's not just me saying that I enjoyed it. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to see so many other people enjoying it. I feel like for once I'm going with the crowd. That doesn't happen to me uh, that often. Usually I love something and it's like, oh gosh, you're going to listen to that same aha song again, as my wife will say to me. And I, I've, 
How do you write, by the way? That makes me think of that because when I write, I listen to the most generic 80s music, the most, and I say generic just because I don't want to say lousy, but you know, all those songs that I grew up when I was a high school kid listening to, I listen to those and I always explain it as it sort of occupies a part of my brain that just isn't going to do any work. I don't want to listen to anything too heavy. I don't want to be thinking about it or have emotions evoked. So how do you write? What do you do when you're writing this over a big span of years? You need to keep things organized. You are working so you don't have a lot of time maybe to just sit in a quiet room. How did you go about writing the book? So I started writing it in little snippets and scenes. Scenes would come to me and I would write them down and they wouldn't necessarily be anything that was successive in terms of the story. But when I retired from my full-time job in order to write Even in Darkness, sort of tried to do it full-time, I didn't quite manage that. I am a person who writes best in quiet, I'm very, very lucky to have access to a wonderful spot in northern Michigan overlooking Lake Michigan and the sand dunes, and that's where I do my best writing, but I am speaking to you now from my other great spot, which is my office and our home, looking out into a great big pine tree, and I am one of those people who needs quiet, so (laughs) I close my door and spend time getting into it and writing. I wish I could say that I'm a disciplined writer who gets up at five o'clock every morning and writes straight for two hours, but that's not me. (laughs) (laughs) And while you were talking, I checked your Amazon rating. You have 4.7 out of five stars to be exact. 75% of your ratings are five-star reviews, 22% are four-star. You do have 3% that are three stars, but there's not a single reader that has given you a one or a two-star review, and I guess maybe only one or a couple that have given you three. So think about that, five stars, 75%. So it's really something you should be proud of, especially, again, as a first-time author. That should be inspiring to everybody who reads the book or even just hears the interview. Thank you so much, Dean. I want to close where you do in the book, and that's with your acknowledgments in Even in Darkness. They read sort of like a nonfiction textbook. Research blends seamlessly into your narrative. You don't linger on things. You don't shove in a lot of jargon or dates, except for those ones at the top there of each chapter. There's clearly an effort here going on when you read the book and then the acknowledgments that had a lot of support from not just your family that you mentioned, not just your great aunt, but a lot of people there, a lot of researchers, people who helped you find things and nail things down. If anybody listening knows somebody who has a family story in them, or maybe they're like that writer being x-rayed and they see, oh, hey, wait a minute, you do have a book inside you. I wanted to ask, how would you encourage them to go about fulfilling that dream of writing a novel themselves? What advice can you give them for getting their book not just written, not just published, but that first step, which is always the hardest, just starting to write it? That's a great question, too. I guess I'd say that if it feels very daunting, start by just writing short snippets, short scenes, little vignettes that occur to you. I believe that people don't start thinking about a story they want to write necessarily in big, broad brushes. They start thinking characters pop out at them or scenes pop out at them. Just write those. And then by all means, sit down with family elders or the people that you think can best inform your story and just listen to them and take copious notes. Get them on tape or on video, some means of recording their stories. And if you can, go to the places that the stories you want to write about actually happened in. So I guess what I'm saying is immerse yourself in the story as best you can and I would always advise to find a trusted writing partner or mentor to bounce ideas off and to support your efforts. When I first started writing Even in Darkness, I gave myself as a retirement gift the opportunity to go to a writer's conference that the University of Michigan puts on called Bear River. And when I went there, 
my teacher was the very wonderful novelist Elizabeth Kostova, and I spent a week working with her, and she helped me figure out that what I really needed to do was write this as a novel and not as a memoir, because it could have gone either way. But I personally really wanted to write it as a novel. So find a mentor, find a writing group. And then the other big issue is to decide who your audience is going to be and to cultivate that audience as you move the story forward. Who is going to enjoy this? Who is it going to be meaningful for? And then in terms of actual publishing, the best thing you can do is to get yourself out there and then you'll get to meet wonderful people like the History Author Show host. <laughs> no, thank you. Get on Twitter, get on Facebook, blog, podcast, write articles, get out there where your audience is and create interest in your topic and in your book. Those are, I guess, my biggest recommendations. Well, Barbara Stark Neiman, I'm glad, so glad that you chose to keep at all of those things and do all of those things to bring Even in Darkness to print. Thank you so much for joining me today and for your compliments. I'm sorry that I slobbered all over your book because I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing this novelized story, the many stories here of your family's journey through the 20th century, some of its darkest moments, but ultimately a story of love and of those flowers coming up in the spring. I wish you continued success with the book and the best of luck, although judging by all all those stickers on the cover, I don't think you need luck. Oh, thank you so much, Dean, and it's been a real pleasure to join you. Well, the pleasure was all mine. Again, the novel is Even in Darkness. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will use that link or even navigate through the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you want to buy anything from Amazon. You come to HistoryAuthor.com, we take you to Amazon, and Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make at no additional charge in your shopping cart. Thanks to Barbara Stark Neiman for joining us, and thank you, Barbara, for climbing that very tall mountain that first-time authors face when they want to publish the great American novel. You can find Barbara online at barbarastarkneeman.com, at bstarkneeman on Twitter, or at facebook.com slash starkneeman. That last name is N-E-M-O-N. And if you forget how to spell it, don't worry. I have a feeling we'll be seeing it on a lot of book covers in the future. And remember, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or facebook.com slash history author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're signed up for us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.